Hello guys, welcome to another episode of the Commerce Lab by EcomC, the place of everything related to Amazon FBA Prime Level and e-commerce. My name is Vincenzo Roscano, your host, founder and CEO of EcomC, and today we bring another special guest. His name is Lenny, and he's the co-founder of AZ Seller Kit, which is one of the top solutions out there to understand your profitability and actually automate your pricing. And I think this is very important, especially the second bar pricing. I think that's huge, especially in 2024 understanding like how you find the perfect price point for your product which at the same time that's gonna uh, reflect in your profitability and therefore if you don't really tap into that and don't do a lot of split testing which i see across all sellers you're definitely gonna struggle as an amazon seller so Lenny, it's a pleasure to have you here on the show thank you so much for being here how you doing my friend fantastic thank you for having me always a pleasure thank to you. you know have have these conversations i feel like it's great I feel like we're blessed to be in this industry where everyone's so open and so willing to talk to each other and hang out. It's amazing. Of course. Yeah, that's all about that is provide as much value, share our knowledge. And at the end of the day, I like the fact that we are like a big family. You know, we always uh, got each other back. Uh, and you see that we have so many Facebook groups, WhatsApp groups, webinars. So it's amazing. Um, so Lenny, let's start with you. Like you have such a, an amazing background as well. You've been in the space for so many years now. So tell us a little bit about how everything started and what made you found as a seller kit. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've definitely been in the space uh, a long <laughs> time. I started my career in, in uh, retail, uh, selling music and games and movies and books. And Amazon okay. was a bookstore. So been selling on Amazon since they first opened the marketplace talking about early 2000s, maybe 2001, something like that. Um, yeah. So been on the platform forever. We pivoted to uh, when streaming really took over, we pivoted into apparel online specifically, mm -hmm. right? Our retail stores had closed and, you know, the, that entire industry went away brick and mortar. Now it's pretty much all online or streaming. So we pivoted to uh, direct to consumer with a heavy focus on Amazon and we got into the apparel category. And so we, we sell apparel on Amazon now. And um, okay. selling apparel means managing tens of thousands of SKUs. Every season, there's two seasons a year. Every season, it's a brand new catalog that has to go up. So you're always listing new product, always launching. And it's not like you're launching one item. When the new season hits, there's 50 new styles. And each style comes in five colors. And each color comes in six sizes. So like the variation counts and the listing counts get up there. So very quickly, we started uh, leaning heavily on technology to streamline our business. It's the only way we were able to scale up. And so we started yeah. writing software for ourselves. The software was working very well uh, for ourselves. And, and uh, so we kind of had, we had to make a decision at one point, you know, what's our five-year vision? <clears throat> How can we help the most sellers how can we impact this amazon community or the direct to consumer community you know how can we have the greatest impact so if we try and scale up our agency that's very challenging you take on more clients and uh it, it could dilute the level of service so we didn't really want to go that route and we stayed with our core clients that we work with now and we thought the software that we have, why don't we make it front facing and make it available to uh, to other sellers? Like that could help people, uh, and it's kind of self serve. Like once you start using it, you're using it yourself. So we thought that could have more greater reach, greater potential to impact more sellers. So we ended up starting AZ Seller Kit, and um, yeah, I guess the rest is. Uh, uh, I love it. Fast forward, <laughs> uh, fast forward a few more years, and and. Uh, just this whole idea of community and and building. So we wanted to be more engaged and just trying to have more reach and learn, right? One thing I'll say is student first. Yeah, always a student, just listening to and trying to learn from how other people are running their businesses and trying to take the positives from everything you hear. But um, it yeah. led us to start the Ecom Cooperative, which is another organization that, that uh, I joined early on and... Uh, the goal for the Ecom Cooperative is to just really build a community of both service providers and sellers and, and host in-person events and networking events and things like that. And so that's another another layer 
another one of yeah the i love them yeah. yeah yeah i know you're very active as well in the community you do you know amazing events as well with the with the actually if i'm not mistaken you're actually one of the board members as well of the ecom cooperative right so which is yeah. an amazing community in the amazon space you guys are doing so many webinars so many uh, physical events so yeah you're definitely touching all the different bubbles that you can provide value into in the amazon community which is awesome now let's talk about um and first of all, the other thing I want to also touch on is that that's the, also the beauty of this space. When we encounter these pains about struggles mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. uh, have as founders, usually that's where most of the software solutions out there actually uh, were created in the first place because it was out of a necessity. And therefore, usually as an Amazon seller, when you have a necessity and you go through struggles, all the Amazon sellers are also going to have that struggle. And therefore, creating a solution yeah. is usually something that people are going to get a lot of value out of that, you know? So let's talk about um, the pricing. The, basically, that's something I mentioned at the beginning of, of, of the episode. I feel pricing is something that most people are getting wrong when it comes to pricing. And I see this all the time when I do audits. Um, they really kind of doing this as a gamble, right? They had a coupon, they had a, a, a prime deal, they had a buy two and get one for free, or they have a sell price, but they, there isn't really any data and driven um, um, decision making behind that. It's just the fact that, oh, I want to sell more. I just reduce my price saying 15%, which is industry standard and see what happens, but it's not driven by KPIs, right? And I know that's what some of the core things you guys do as uh, is, is a seller kit. So tell us a little bit about, you know, the importance of pricing and how you're seeing that affecting your brands and your clients as well. Nico. Yeah. So, so I, I feel like, um, we stumbled into pricing, yeah, I, I, the par for the course business 101. You have to know what your costs are. So you know your cost of goods. You know your, uh, you know what if you're paying any royalties or you have to pay agencies any commissions or you're spending money. You know what your costs are in terms of, you know, what it takes to get this product delivered to a customer, right? So the the business 101 is you buy low, sell high. So you're adding up your cost of goods plus all your other costs. That's what you're buying for. You want to try and make X amount of margin. So you tack on some profit on top of that, and then that's what you're selling for. There, there are other basic factors that'll go into figuring out your initial price. Like you'll do market research and see where what the competitive landscape is like, and then figure out where you want to fall in between. And then you'll pick your price, and that's what you'll launch with, and that's what you'll go. You know, that's typically how you know uh, uh, you should decide your first price, your entry. You have to know mm -hmm. all of your costs and all of your expenses and then understand how much margin you need to make the function. And if the combination of those two fits in the market, then you can compete. So then launch your item at a price, right? But yeah, it's so uh, another, another very common, you know, where do I get my Amazon price from? Another very common thing for larger sellers that have brick and mortar presence. So they sell their product to all the chain stores also, right? So they might think, I sell my product to Target or to Macy's or to uh, Kohl's or one of these department stores, right? And in the retail stores, these retailers put the item for $25. <laughs> so if they're retailing it for $25, then I have to be $25 on Amazon. That's the value yeah. of my item. That's what my price is worth. Now, my item's worth yeah. $25. So, so right away, you might say, oh. $25 works. I have enough room in there to make money and da, da, da. So I'll leave it at 25 because that's the value of my product. So determined by these other retailers, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so like in general, like those are the two areas that people will get their pricing from just calculated based on what they need to make and it fits the market or they're in brick and mortar. So the other retailers establish the value, but Amazon's a different marketplace. I think, um, yeah. I, uh, in one of the, I, speak about this topic sometimes. I have some slides that I would present. Like mm -hmm. one of the slides, you're familiar with Keepa, right? Keepa yeah. is a software that tracks pricing historically. So I put up a Keepa chart of one of the best sellers in the apparel category, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's like a Hanes t-shirt or something. Hanes six-pack t-shirt or something like that. And yeah. it shows the pricing over time. And it's a chart that just goes up and down over time. This item must have fluctuated in price between $18 and $25 
every day for five years straight. It goes up and down and up and down. And the idea yeah. that I'm trying to convey when I'm showing that to people is that Amazon is not like a retail store. On Amazon, the consumer is trained. The price is what the price is right now today. Yeah. And if I come back tomorrow, it could be something different, and that's fine. <laughs> The Amazon exactly. customer understands that. They're used to it. I mean, Amazon grew up and started as a book or DVD company, you know, selling media. There were third-party sellers on that stuff, left and right. The prices were yeah. all over the place. I mean, that's how the Amazon consumer is trained, and that's what they're used to. So don't yeah. be afraid of changing prices, right? Yeah, and that's, that, the, that's the first message that I, I, whenever I, I get to talk on this topic, I'll I'll try and just get that out there. Like you should test your price. You came in at your math is 25 bucks and that's what you, that's the price you need to be at. Great. Try 26, try 27. See if your sales velocity stays the same, you know, or if uh, you were at 25, maybe you're selling 50 units a day of your item. Try mm -hmm. 24, try 23. Yeah. See if now you'll sell, you know, your margin might be lower, but maybe you'll make more in profit dollars because your volume goes up. I mean, so th that's like the basic ideas behind uh, just the concept of pricing. You're a private label seller and you have no buy box competition on your listing. And exactly. just people hear the word repricer and they say, no, no, I don't need a repricer, you know, or... Yeah. or you know, because they're private label, you, you hear repricer, you hear wholesale, you know, oh, exactly. buy box competition There's 30 sellers on the listing. But that's even uh, you should be testing your pricing as as a private label seller also. Um, yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story how how we stumbled into this. Right. So okay. I told you we started in apparel in, in 2015. Right. Yeah. So I, I was buying my inventory uh, from. I was taking from retail stock. The manufacturer was selling to brick and mortar retailers. And so I was buying inventory that was ready for retail. So what does that mean? That means that in one box, there's uh, no item is individually polybagged. So wow. everything in the box loose. And the box is assorted, small, medium, large, extra large, four, eight, eight, four. Those are the quantities. 24 in a box, four small, wow. eight, medium, eight, large, four, extra large. So, if I a to, so, so now... <laughs> On Amazon, you have to list each one as its own SKU. We have to poly bag yeah. and label everything. And the challenge became when we started selling, things were selling well. So now, okay, the medium, there's a reason they put the ratio with more mediums than smalls. The medium's a more popular size. So I sold out of the medium. I still have stock left on the small. What do I do? I can't order the medium. I have to buy a case that comes mixed. So mm -hmm. we bought a case. We did it again and again. And then... After some time, you end up with stockpiles of inventory on the two yeah. sizes that don't move. So yeah. we said, how do we fix this problem? And we started playing with our pricing. And that's really what started it for us. So we would take the small and the extra large and lower the price because we were overstocked on those. We would take the medium and the large and raise the price to try and throttle the sales. I, my intention was slow down the sales. It's selling too fast. Yeah, and I so I, I might have been selling for twenty bucks, and so we tried twenty-two. I want to slow down the sales. The sales didn't slow down. <laughs> Shit, let's try twenty-three. Let's try twenty-four. We got to twenty-five. Finally, at twenty-five, the sales started slowing down to a pace where I could reorder and it would make sense. Yeah, and so when we saw that, <clears throat> so if you have, you know, eighty listings, a hundred listings, and each listing has uh seven or eight colors with all the different size variations to manage each one by itself th there was in the beginning we were doing it manually we were doing it yeah. manually and I'm just focusing on our big on our top sellers once we wow. saw that it was working accomplishing what we wanted our our margins went up and yeah. um, and even though we were selling the other items at a lower price we were actually selling more volume of them and we were able to restock without being to, to re reorder without getting overstocked and so we automated it and that was the first version of our pricer was just inventory based supply and demand like basic concept and, yeah uh, good wow that, that's that's quite a story what 
<laughs> you went to a, a big struggle, man, a big struggle. So yeah. I, I think it's something that I'm very curious to learn because I 100% I agree with you. People is very reactive only on the surface, like, okay, what are the retailers are doing when it comes to price? What is my competition doing? And you also say something very important. People is afraid to change price. I have met sellers that they haven't changed the price since 2016, 17. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy. Like everything went up and you're, you're not increasing your prices. Like that's crazy. And at the same time, I feel where I really want to tap in when it comes to having a conversation with you is I feel pricing is also um, a conversion thing, right? And people don't measure that realistically. Like when I mean conversions, not only from the perspective of a sale, but how many extra people not click on your listing, the extra increase in impressions, how's that affecting the overall KPIs besides only sales? And, um, and, I'm, and I know the definitely the decision making around those KPIs can allow you to make even more clever decisions when it comes to finding the right price. So I'm curious to learn, like, you guys, when it comes to playing with price, like, do you also look at those KPIs? Like, okay, at this price point, I have very conversion at this price point and split testing. Is that something you you also advise to to implement? So in terms of the, the automation that the tool has built in, we, over the years, we tried different things. <laughs> what mm -hmm. we ended up with when the, the primary way it works now, it's reading sales velocity. So okay. at the end of the day, if I'm selling a hundred units a day on my mm -hmm. listing and I'm playing and I raise my price, am I still selling a hundred units a day? You know, if I went from 25 to $26, am I still selling a hundred units a day? And if I am, so let's push the needle again and try 27 or try 28. Now at some point, at some point, the higher price will erode your sales so yeah i mean that's just basic knowledge right the higher the price the lower the sales the lower the price mm -hmm. the higher the sales it's like business 101 type of concept but we'll try and push it till we see where the velocity where where your sales actually start to slow down and what if the sales do start to slow down so then the system will mark down we'll start bringing the price back down to try and get the velocity mm -hmm. to go back up yeah, so so the, the primary premise is uh, the sales velocity. That's the major KPI awesome. that we're looking at. And uh, the other layer, the other element of that that you can't ignore is seasonality. Mm. Because, yeah. you know, if you sell winter coats, then your item is going to have the velocity of X, you know, let's say uh, 100 units a day in december january february but maybe march april springtime starts coming coats don't sell in the spring so your velocity is going to drop velocity dropping because the weather changed doesn't mean you should drop your price yeah so so seasonality plays a role in the algorithm also we'll look at the seasonal trend and make sure that it's not an expected drop if the drop is something that's expected based on historical trending and things like that so then it won't it'll adjust the pricing accordingly awesome. so it's important now, to look at seasonality good now when it comes to doing a uh, pricing strategies i guess something people might be wondering as well is like how do you avoid a uh, maybe creating this phenomenon where people could figure out that you are very unstable with pricing like one day i go on your listing you're 15 one day you're 12 one day you're 17. so based on that and to avoid that kind of a um, perspective from a consumer point of view do you is there a minimum amount of time you have to wait before um changing the price again like do you do yeah. it daily do you do it every week how, how you do them yeah yeah definitely so it uh, depends how aggressive you want to be in your business specifically like everyone has to make that decision on, on their business level but uh once a day maximum twice a day you know okay. you, you change a price you need time to read data and see mm -hmm. how the market reacts to it you can't just uh change it multiple times a day the only the only um caveat or exception maybe would be if you are a seller that that has the best seller badge if you're a top of your category right if you're the number one best seller in your categories that badge means a lot in terms of the conversion mm -hmm. rates right if you lose that badge and then react not a good thing 
you know so mm -hmm. for, for sellers that are holding that badge i would take a completely different pricing strategy approach it would be so much more cautious uh because exactly. you want to do everything proactively to to keep mm -hmm. that badge but if you have things that have a bsr of five thousand a thousand mm -hmm. two thousand yeah. you know twenty thousand fifty thousand a hundred thousand and you're you selling the risk yeah, yeah, you can take what's going to happen. You know, you'll have a day. The cust the market will react. They'll tell you if the consumers who are shopping will tell you we we support this price or we don't. You'll see yeah. the sales slow down if they don't, and then okay, lower the price. It didn't work. Try again next week. Yeah, you know and that, that's what it does. It'll test, and if it doesn't work, it'll come back down, and then it'll wait a few days and then test again. And if it didn't work, come back down because just because a price increase didn't work in. January 15th doesn't mean it won't work on February 8th. You know, maybe uh, the market changed, maybe something else in the landscape changed. And especially yeah. with yeah. all the fees coming up the way they have been now, I think there's a big one launching in a couple, a, a new fee that's going to start hitting in a couple of days, low inventory yeah. fee. That's so big. Like, pe yeah. People are raising prices. You have to, that you can't get out of it today. You know, yeah. for the last yeah. couple of years, maybe you could, but with the way <laughs> things have been going, and now four or five fees went up this year: the inbound placement yeah. fee, and the low inventory fee, and the revised long-term storage fees, and the other fee, and the this fee. Mm -hmm. so, so, eventually, the market's going to catch up and start raising prices. So, yeah. if you tested a price three months ago, doesn't mean that today that's not going to work the market's going to be changing so you should always oh. be testing good now when when it comes to testing pricing i guess you also within that testing i guess you you should define boundaries right what, what i mean by boundaries like if you're a very healthy brand you want to stay within specific price one because your core is profitability but if you're launching maybe your boundaries are much more aggressive like you're willing to lose money and stay within a boundary that is break even losing money so from your experience when it comes to that like uh, is that something that uh, you also advise like having different bandwidths to play with or realistically it's always driven based on sales velocity because i guess at the beginning what i'm trying to say if you have no reviews your placement is not there and you're really getting started like uh, maybe reducing price to some extent uh, if it's not significant it's not going to move the needle and give you that sales velocity so you have to combine this with all elements like a strong ppc external traffic or things like what is wh what is your take on that that's one. i think i think you, you touched on an important point but when you're talking about this topic you have mm -hmm. to make sure you cover so it's good you brought it up launching uh, I would not recommend playing with pricing on launch. You know, okay. I, we we typically would not touch the price. Uh, for us, when we launch an item, our strategy uh, for that works for our business has been to launch with the first few days. We launch with a high price. Okay, I, and I, I launch with what my target price. I want to sell my item for thirty dollars. You know, I'm not at the bottom of the market in terms of price. I price myself where I feel my brand can get that value. I know my listing quality is tops. My images yeah. and my um, A plus content, SDR. everything, everything's tops, right? So the listing quality and the content is all there, and I can get the premium. So I'll launch at my premium price. I'll leave that price for a couple of days, and spend heavily on PPC. I need to generate sales at that price. Once I get two or three sales. The reference price on Amazon is now established. So once the reference price is established, then I'll take my my launch and mark it down to fifty off. I'll put it forty ninety nine. And now by doing that, because I got the sale at thirty, and I waited, I got a few sales at thirty dollars. Amazon now thinks this That's item is a thirty dollar item. Mm -hmm. So then when I reduce it to fifteen for my launch, to be aggressive. What happened? Yeah. I got a slash through 50% off. And that slash through yeah. will last for 30 days, which is a big part of the launch. So yeah, that's when we'll do the slash through and mark it down instead of coming out on day one with a low price. Out of the gate. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Start with a high price. Start with your target price or maybe even a little bit above your target price. Get some sales. Mm -hmm. After you have a few sales in the pipeline, then we'll bring the price down. And when the price goes down, you launch with Vine, wait till reviews kick in. So between reviews kicking in 
that's when we'll really go full throttle on the PPC to try and push the, you know, once it has at least one review. Yeah. That's a, that's a exactly. positive one, four or five stars. So then you start pushing on the PPC, and then the thing goes up. By the time the item gets to 60 days or 75 days old, we feel like we're done losing money. <laughs> you know, now, yeah, now, exactly. let's, now let's see if we can get back to even. So then you start raising the price. So if you are at 15, go to 18. Yeah. And we don't do it in tiny batches uh, of yeah. you know 50 cent increments. We'll try 15. I'll go to go to 18. I'm at 18. I'll try 20. 19.99 is the number. It's a special price point. 19.99. Try 22.99. 22.99. Yeah. Try 24.99. You know, I I, I need cool. to be at that 25, 30 dollar number to be profitable. So you'll inch your way back up over a couple of cool. weeks' time and hope that it sticks the landing. Nice. And and just to start concluding, you mentioned there's something very interesting, which is sell price. Um, I feel when it comes to playing with pricing. There's many ways you can do this. You can do this with the list price, the sell price, but then there are things that you can throw into the equation, such as vouchers, uh, prime deals, and all that kind of uh, basically extra tools that Amazon gives you. So from your experience, when you play with pricing, do they also kind of enter into this approach when you're testing price? Like, what do you do with vouchers? What do you do with uh, prime deals? What do you do with promotion, like stacking buy two and get one for free? Like, are those also a core foundation of the testing? Or you try to keep it more at the sell price um, feature, and that's it. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, so if you're talking about the the tool, the software, in terms of what it automates, it automates only the straight price. Mm -hmm. It'll it'll test yeah. up and down pricing. It, it's it's yeah. effective on running evergreen items, uh, awesome. but in terms of pricing strategy in general, like what we, do, what we do in our business, definitely. So, uh, list reference prices will determine where you get the slash through or, or not right and if you run a prime exclusive deal a ped uh that that doesn't display as uh being sold exactly. with a, with a discount that's the equivalent if you're shopping as a prime member you just see the ped price you just see the price as is uh, you don't even see that it was selling for 29 and if you're logged in without prime then you'll see the high price with exactly. a little message that says you know, if you're wrong, and roll yeah, in prime wrong. and get this item for three dollars off. You know, that, that's how they try and send them. So, PDs are they're okay. Um, but coupons, especially if you can afford larger coupons, bigger discounts, mm -hmm. uh, they're effective at driving conversion rates uh, up, click through rates nice. at least go up when you add a coupon. Yeah. Um, anything you can get a badge in the search results, like so, best deals, lighting deals as well. Yeah, yeah. If you can get a badge in the search results, your click through rate will go up. And if your click through rate goes up, you hope your conversion rate and your sales go up into follow. So, you know, awesome. we definitely utilize those tools. It's a big part of the strategy for sure, but um, awesome. not automated cool. but there. Yeah, cool. Nice. Uh, so I guess to to conclude, Lenny, I mean, we have talked about everything, like how your tool, you know, can significantly help automate all these things, how we analyze when uh, to define the different stages of, of playing with pricing. pricing. So we just talked about things such as, um, the elements such as coupons and all of that. I guess now to come to a closure, uh, what other thing you would want to share with the audience today when it comes to pricing? Any last a tip or a strategy that maybe you think is going to be key, especially in 2024, to have a successful journey when it comes to selling on Amazon? Yeah, I was uh, I was just at a roundtable uh, discussion with a bunch of sellers and uh, and service providers uh, the other day, and a major pain point that a lot of other sellers brought up was how to deal with the low inventory fee. Low mm -hmm. inventory fee. Um, Amazon will charge you anywhere between 30 cents to 80 cents per unit if your inventory dips below a certain threshold, right? So they'll charge you per unit sold an additional fee. So that was a big pain point that people were talking about. So I guess the, the only tip I would say with regards to uh, pricing is it's not the end of the world. When you see mm -hmm. that your item kicked into the low inventory level fee, when that starts applying on your item, raise the price by a dollar exactly yeah then it'll be like nothing happened you know again if you're in that best seller badge category where raising the price by a dollar might make a big impact yeah and you have a low inventory fee then you have much bigger problems than the dollar i mean yeah 
bestseller, you never want to be low inventory. But uh, that means you have a logistics issue. You don't have, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so that guy has a lot of other stuff to solve. But um, for the average seller that's on Amazon, uh, these new fees are kicking in and they don't apply in all scenarios. But if you exactly. understand the fees and when they apply, so just adjust your pricing to compensate when they apply. And when you replenish inventory and, and the fee disappeared, put your price back down. It's, it's very simple. So that was one little awesome. tip that uh, came up the other day. I felt appropriate. Thank you, Lenny. That, yeah. That's awesome. So first of all, thank you so much for your time and being on the show. You share as always a gold content. I appreciate for that. And in case people want to reach out to you or maybe work with, with your software and everything, how people can find you and, and get in contact. Yeah. So um, azsellerkit.com is the website. So where is it? A mm -hmm. Azsellerkit, yes. just add a .com at the end. And you can visit us on the website. And uh, my email address, if anyone wants to reach out to me via email, more than welcome to. It's Lenny, L-E-N-N-Y, at MMXDist, short for distribution, MMXDist.com. So nice. uh, feel free to email me and uh, always open to having conversations with people and see if there's any way we can help. Thank you, Lenny. So a pleasure. Uh, looking forward to meet you soon at upcoming events. And uh, man, I appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Always a pleasure. Good to see you. Thank you. Man. See you. Bye-bye.